Hi everyone, I'm Gordon Half, Technology Evangelist with Red Hat, and I'm here today to talk about invention, and specifically invention as a collective activity. And the reason I'm talking about this is that this has become very relevant to the open source development model. Now, I'd argue that historically, in many people's minds, invention has been sort of thought of in this singular context, in terms of an individual. And back in grade school, high school, you know, if you had a quiz about invention, it would be, you know, who invented the steam engine, who invented the refrigerator, who invented the elevator, and maybe you the answer would be something like Bell Labs or Xerox Park, but most likely the answer they'd be looking for would be some specific person. Now, one particular person that epitomizes this is Nikolai Tesla, who's sort of a, uh, a cult figure, particularly a lot of geek communities. And one of the reasons is, is he's often viewed as this singular inventor. So the inventor of AC, the inventor of the Tesla coil, the inventor of various other things. Now, again, I'm not going to say that you don't have singular inventors who really advanced the state of the art significantly on their own, and that was certainly the case with, with Tesla. On the other hand, at the time Tesla was inventing uh, AC, AC um, electricity, there were actually similar types of invention going on in other places. Uh, there was quite a few names that were associated with AC around this time. And of course, they built on other things. The AC electricity didn't come out of thin air. There were, certainly were scientists, uh, who had come up with some of the theory, and there were also other prior inventions. Now, it's certainly true that, as I mentioned, Bell Labs and Xerox Park a minute ago, there are other cases where certainly an inventor like Thomas Edison, in the case of light bulb, very much work and run large laboratories where many people are doing the inventing, even though one person is maybe most associated with it. But also, the, in the case of light bulb, is illustrative of how uh, inventions can build off of previous inventions. So there were actually light bulbs of various kinds before Edison invented the light bulb, that just their filaments didn't last very long, they weren't very practical, and therefore Edison is probably rightly credited with coming up with really the first practical light bulb. It's also the case that someone like James Watt, who is also uh, often credited with inventing the steam engine, in fact also refined previous designs. Now, in, in Watt's case, what he specifically invented was something called the steam condenser, because sort of working on existing steam engines, he recognized that they weren't very efficient. They were using a lot of energy, a lot of uh, heat to uh, boil water into steam, and then a lot of that steam was escaping and not really doing anything terribly useful. So Watson, uh, Watt uh, refined, came up with this invention, the steam condenser, and was able to make a refined steam engine that was significantly more efficient than its predecessors, and therefore it was kind of most associated with steam power really becoming a very important economic force. These sort of connections between different types of inventions and building off of uh, what existed in the past, was captured wonderfully by James Burke in a uh, BBC 
show a number of decades ago called Connections, and uh, very much encourage anybody listening to this to check out the show. I, I think most, if not all, of the episodes are on YouTube, and there's also a companion book. But Bur Burke, Burke is great. He's done did at least a couple other series, but uh, he draws this connection between uh, all these different types of inventions and developments over time and how they kind of led, often rather non-obvious ways, to the modern world. Uh, one example that's a fairly direct uh, connection is Jacquard Loom here, which was invented uh, essentially to automate textile manufacturing uh, in France originally. And it did so by putting the instructions onto punched cards of various types. Now, anybody who is of a certain age, and I will admit to having used computer punch cards uh, in, uh, in school originally, and also paper tape, which is another variation on the same idea. But all of these things where uh, sort of the lineage of how do you package and store a set of instructions, and that's, of course, very core to computers in general today, although we use... Um, usually various forms of magnetic or maybe optical uh, types of storage today rather than uh, physical media like, like this is. Well, now I'd like to talk now a little bit about kind of the the some of the theory about how innovation diffuses, and I'll give you some historical examples, and then I'm going to cap it off with the importance of network effects. So not just diffusion, but sometimes so much stuff comes together at one time and in one place that it has an outsized effect. And there is a particularly good historical example of that. So where this sort of theory of diffusion comes from is actually oft sometimes more, uh, this, this graph in particular, this diagram in particular is sometimes associated more with later authors, but it actually comes from Everett Rogers in the early 1960s. And his theory was that you have these early adopters. You have a small number of innovators, you have a somewhat larger number of early adopters, then you have this majority, and then you have these laggards that only adopt things very late in the cycle. And if you think about how innovations diffuse, it starts out on that left-hand side, becomes popular, and then eventually fills in with the laggards. And uh, Clayton Christensen, longtime professor at Harvard Business School, uh, passed away last year, I had a book uh, called The Innovator's Dilemma, and I, I think until I was doing the research for this talk, I actually thought he was the one who came up with this curve originally, but rather he takes this and he applies this to the idea about how new technologies are adopted and why, uh, why that adoption can be challenging for existing firms. So, for example, in context of saying that People here probably familiar with, uh, you look around 2000 or so, the majority of commercial firms were uh, using uh, Unix. There might have been some laggards who were still using mini computers, but you know, Unix was kind of the big thing in the middle here. Then there was this little thing called Linux coming along, and companies were we're just starting to use that um, Linux, maybe in the early adopter side, and in by around 2000 or so. Um, but I, but mostly it was kind of in that, those leading edge people who were using it. And actually, one of the challenges for the uh, mainstream firms uh, who were catering to this early and late majority was that. Linux wasn't better than what they had, it, but it was cheaper, it was easier to acquire, and it was increasingly good enough for a lot of purposes. One other um, uh, consultant, Jeffrey Moore, 
also took up this idea of this, um, of, you know, kind of, of this curve. And what he really identified was this, what he called chasm between the early adopters and the early late majority. And basically Moore's thesis was that uh, companies and projects and technologies can succeed among these innovators and early adopters, but is a very different process to appeal to the majority. And a lot of a lot of products, projects, technologies just don't make it because they're interesting for the this sort of cutting edge type folks, but they never make it over that chasm to the majority of users. Another way that diffusion has happened historically is geographically. I mean, this is obviously somewhat less relevant today, um, although you still have technologies that for various reasons catch on in particular geographies and don't so much in others, at least not for a while. But if you look at the old trading routes in, oh, you know, maybe 1200s or so starting, something like paper that was invented in China eventually made its way over to Europe and to other places um, by these by these trading routes, and that's the way that that kind of technology spread and was improved and changed in various ways. Uh, something else that was a very important technology called uh, the Norea, uh, its agricultural pumps, and that was invented in. Roman Syria, and it spread east and west and became a rather important innovation uh, in agriculture. And gunpowder, uh, originally invented in China, and it made its way uh, across, across the map. Again, various innovations and changes along the way. Gunpowder could be used for a lot of different purposes. Um, it, you know, not even just limited to military, and and it and that innovation diffused in various ways, and this really happened in all kinds of different technology areas. I mean, we could we could spend you know next hour or so in these, but this is an example from uh, how uh, viticulture uh, growing growing grapes spread from uh, essentially near the hilly flanks where agriculture initially developed into all these other geographies, at least where the climate was suitable for growing grapes. And here's some uh, technology adoption curves for various types of technology, consumer technologies that um, anybody here is probably going to be aware of. And yeah, you know, things happened at different rates. So for example, the cell phone, once it started to really take off, really took off. And this is, I think, a somewhat older curve. Um, you know, obviously, yeah, cell phone's quite a bit higher up there now. And I think it's... Uh, so the, the shape of these curves vary, but the basic idea that you usually have this ramp up period and then it really soars in, you know, if it crosses the chasm, it soars into that majority audience. And then eventually you either, uh, you know, hit essentially 100 percent, as in the case of TV, or you plateau at some level where uh there, there's only you know maybe twenty percent of the audience just you know isn't really into it, and uh, so you hit some uh, top line. This is uh, there's another study that looked at European patents and using patents as kind of a proxy for technology advance, and that's an, and that's kind of an important element here. We're not talking just that it takes time for people to decide to use something, but rather that the thing that they are using is advancing. And uh, Robert Allen uh, did some of the early studies, uh, studying this collective invention idea in the early 1980s. 
And what Alan was studying was blast furnaces in the UK. So, um, you know, basically smelting, smelting furnaces. And he was looking at how blast furnaces were improving over time and trying to figure out how these improvements were happening, how the information was diffusing. And here's some numbers um, that he, you know, he got from some sources, and that basically chimneys were getting higher by and large. And this, he was using this as a proxy for the improvement of blast furnaces. You know, there were other changes happening as well, but the chimney height seemed like a good proxy for uh, the general goodness of the blast furnaces. And he drew some conclusions that I think are relevant in open source and elsewhere. The first is, a lot of this was fairly incremental. And you know, this, this sounds maybe a little like DevOps and Agile and all that kind of thing. Was, you know, these were, by and large, major game-changing advances. I mean, there were some of those going on in the Industrial Revolution as well. But by and large, the, the pattern was, increment, was incremental. He also found pioneers and followers. His idea there were, uh, or there were com you know companies um, that were that wanted the biggest, bestest, fastest blast furnace. And then there were some who were willing to take these uh, advances in technology and just milk them for the low cost. Uh, and you, you can imagine the same thing today with something like TVs. You know, if you just want basic flat panel TV, you can get one really cheap. But maybe you all take advantage of technology instead so you can have this great, big, latest and greatest OLED panel instead. And I think the important thing here is he concluded that, yeah, there was some publication in engineering literature, but by and large, a lot of this was informal disclosure because company, companies and individuals found that the friction involved in kind of trying to keep secrets was outweighed by the benefits of sharing. And this sounds an awful lot like the open source development model. Finally, I'm, I just love this. I just love this graph. And Andrew McAfee has also used it in his Second Machine Age book. But this is from uh, a book called Why the West Rules for Now by uh, anthropologist Ian Morris. And um, good book. It's actually a pretty nice uh, history of the Eastern and the Western cores. It's not really a world history, but it's a history of those two cores, which were historically the most advanced for various reasons, including the fact that, you know, in a nod to Jared Diamond, gun germs, and steel, they were the two cores that, for a variety of geographic reasons, sort of had the head start. And the really interesting thing about this uh, chart is that, you know, based, he used this social development index, which, you know, very numerically oriented attempt to capture how advanced civilizations were. And basically, by, you know, in the grand scheme of things compared to today, nothing happened until essentially the Industrial Revolution or Industrial Revolutions. And then this coming together of technology, the steam engine, uh, for example, uh, everything just took off. All this stuff came together to make things look like they hadn't before. And I think we may see something similar related to open source software today. This is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, landscape. They actually have an interactive landscape uh, these days because, well, you can see this. If you try and put all in one page, uh, it's kind of hard to read. But I, I think this idea that you have all this innovation happening, and to a degree that innovation is being shared and feeding off each other, that's an incredibly powerful thing. And therefore, I, I see that we may be in software kind of where the Industrial Revolution was with technology more generally. So thank you for your time, and I hope you found this helpful.